Yeah, I did. <laughs> Amen. I'm so happy to see all of you here. My goodness, Josh, it's good to have you again with us this morning. And uh, Sister Emma, it's good to see you too. I thought I saw you earlier. And uh, you got hit there behind uh, Brother Jackie a little bit, which that's not hard to do. <laughs> and uh, he, <laughs> he, he gave me some rules yesterday. We get him in the baptistry, I got to get a helper. <laughs> uh, and it's got to be Marcus. So that'll be all right. He liable to pull us both in. <laughs> Have any of y'all seen that uh, that YouTube video of that guy baptizing somebody? And the, when he baptized him, the guy got so happy he pulled the preacher under the water. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, as hot as I am this morning, that may not be too bad. Uh, I feel like I don't know what the deal is. Maybe just hot flashes going through the change or something. <laughs> In Luke chapter 2, <laughs> verse 52. Oh, Jesus. I'm on a roll this morning, so hope everybody's prayed up. Uh, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. This scripture, this one passage of scripture, is all we have of the life of Jesus Christ between the ages of 12 and 30. This one passage of scripture is all we have of his life. The preceding verses, 42 through 50, deal with an isolated incident when he was 12 years old. At the time of the Passover, his family went to Jerusalem and they went annually when the time came to return to Nazareth, Joseph and Mary headed home. But Jesus was left behind unbeknownst to his parents. Apparently three days passed, Brother Rice, before they found Jesus. And when they found him, he was in the temple. Sitting in the midst of the doctors, the Bible says, which is the rabbis or scholars. It's not medical doctors, but it's, it's uh, education doctors. Uh, and uh, they were both here. He was hearing them, and he was asking them questions. And Brother Billy, the Bible said the doctors were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Now, you have to put this in the proper perspective. And uh, I, I've read this all of my life and heard all of my life, but until you begin to study a little bit around the context and the setting, we got to imagine this was Jesus Christ's first trip ever to Jerusalem. Amen. This was his first time entering into the city of Jerusalem. Boys were not allowed to go until they were 12 years old. And what a myriad of emotions must have ran through his mind. Brother McKinney, as he takes his first trip to Jerusalem, which we know will be the place he also takes his last trip as a man in, in the flesh. Uh, uh, um, uh, unlike most boys his age, who would have been uh, overcome with the emotions of the, of the moment and who would have been uh, uh, maybe just sitting quietly because it was a big deal when they were 12 years old to be allowed to come and participate in the Passover. But it's not amazing to those, those of us that know who Jesus is uh, that he wasn't drawn to the festivities uh, but he was drawn to the knowledge. He was drawn to the temple, to the place where you learn and, and where you ask questions and where there's discussion and undoubtedly when the the, the, the teaching of his parents uh, that he had been taught from the time he was a little boy coupled with the anointing of the Spirit of God that was in him and upon him there was a tremendous overflowing of desire and awareness uh, there was a tremendous uh, 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 aptitude to receive what was available at the temple in Jesus Christ uh, but brother Billy I am amazed when I see uh, that even in Jesus Christ uh, there was a longing uh, a desire Desire, a hunger to know more. Amen. Notice in our text, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Wisdom is subjective. Everybody's not automatically wise. Right? And stature is objective. 
You don't have any control over how tall you're going to be. How, how big you're going to grow. Now we have some control over spreading out. But that has nothing to do with the natural growth process. It's only subject to genetics. But the Bible said he increased in wisdom and stature. And in favor with God. And in favor with God, which we don't have much problem understanding how that happened. Seeing he was God manifest in a fleshly body. Fully God and fully man. But the Bible also says that he grew in favor with man. Now wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. You can have all the knowledge in the world and have no wisdom. Right? And then you can be uneducated and wise. You don't learn wisdom in a classroom. The best place you learn wisdom is through experience. And the beautiful thing about being Holy Ghost filled is the wisdom that you glean from following after the leading of the Spirit. And stature is a natural growth process. When we speak of favor with God and with man, when a proper understanding of the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind is present, these two are usually in conflict. We find it very difficult to live an overcoming life with God, overcoming in the Holy Ghost, and also finding favor with God and man. Right? It's difficult to reconcile having favor with God and with man. We, we have a difficult time seeing a way to please both. In fact, we preach strongly concerning the need to keep the two separated. As a man, man's approval poses an obstacle in many cases to being approved by God. You will find it difficult to seek the approval of men and also be approved by God. But I would submit to you that in the natural process of things, as you find approval with God, you will also find yourself being approved by man. <laughs> Although we are aware that Jesus' approval with man hit a snag or hit an obstacle when it came time to choose Jesus or Barabbas. And all the peoples chose Barabbas and they cried with one voice. When Pilate said, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They said, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our head and the head of our children. Which is incredibly arrogant, by the way. You don't have the right to, do, to damn and condemn your children by decisions you make. That's the height of arrogance. This was due. Brother Billy, I think we've got to look at this with a proper perspective. This was not due to the fact that they didn't like Jesus. Now, this is going to be a paradox. Why did they cry crucify him? Somebody tell me what Jesus had done to them. Well, in, in, in that manner of speaking, you're right. But I, I think that he fed them, he healed them, he blessed them, he touched them. I don't find anything in there anywhere. He ran them out of the temple when they were using the sacrificial process to make money. And said, my house should be called the house of prayer and you made it a den of thieves. And he cursed the fig tree. Best I can tell, everything else he did, Brother McKinney, was good. And that was good from his perspective. But the only things he ever did that would make somebody angry at him. Matter of fact, he, he probably did more things to his disciples to make them angry than anybody. He called Peter the devil. Remember that? Yeah. Peter said, no, you're not going to go die. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. And then Peter tried to take up for him in the garden. Whipped out his sword, cut off one of the old boy's ear. And Jesus had the audacity to heal him and get on to Peter. <laughs> so they said crucify him now this is as I said this is going to seem like a paradox because what I'm talking to you this morning about is the keys to approval 
But the only reason that they cried crucify him concerning Jesus had nothing to do with Jesus. Amen. And everything to do with being approved by man. They only did it because the religious zealots of the day had, had pumped everybody up and they had talked down about Jesus. And, and Jesus did it. Nobody knew anything. They got some people to come lie on him just like they did on Stephen, just like they'd done many other times. Brother Pete, nobody knew anything about Jesus that would get him killed. Yeah. Nobody knew where they had to lie. They made it up. They lied. They tried to take his words and twist them. And there's a lesson that we can be well learned when that happens. For the most part, Jesus stood there with his mouth shut. He wouldn't respond to their, their cuts and, and to their sarcasm. And he didn't respond when they slapped him and said, you know, they blindfolded him. How, I, I think about seeing them mistreat Jesus like they did. They blindfolded him and then said, now tell us who blind, who's standing in front of you. Making fun, ridiculing. Brother Pete, the, the, the irony of it is, is, is that the whole time he knew who was talking to him. But he wouldn't respond to their cuts and their criticism. Because Jesus Christ, whether in, and you know Brother Robbie, that's one of the most beautiful things about it. Whether in success or failure, Jesus Christ never marched to the beat of nobody's drummer. I believe, and I'm off the reservation just a little bit right now, but I believe that that was part of their frustration with him. Is they couldn't get a rise out. They could not control him in any way. Sometimes your higher standard puts an audacity on people that they can't get up to your standard of being good. Absolutely. The Proverbs, book of Proverbs tells us that a soft answer turneth away wrath. And that if, you, that if you be kind or be nice to your enemy, it heaps coals of fire on their head. And, that, and, and Jesus, he, he didn't fight back. He didn't uh, uh, revile them again. He, he just took what they had because he knew that what they were viewing as victory was in fact laying the groundwork for defeat. Of them and the greatest victory that mankind has ever known. So... The, the religious zealots of the day. Rome was never Jesus' enemy. Devil-possessed people were never Jesus' enemy. Heathens and whoremongers were never Jesus' enemy. The religious people were Jesus' enemy. The people that could not grasp a hold of this great and glorious truth that was wrapped up in a package of loving people and having grace and mercy and, and kindness toward people. And Jesus, he, he was a problem to them. Oh, God, help me right now. Jesus only posed a problem to them because of his message of love and grace and making it available to everybody. Clash strongly with their strict adherence to the exclusivity of the law. Brother Billy, they wanted to keep it for themselves. God forbid and have mercy on us if we ever get to the place of our four and no more. I'm going to say that again because I didn't get enough amens. We can never get to the place where we're happy with our little church. We never get to the place where we can decide we don't want to open this up because you get all kinds of folks. We want all kinds of folks. They need us. They need the Holy Ghost. They need the love that we can offer them. They need the power that we can offer them. They need the hand of mercy that we can offer them. Amen. Nevertheless, when we view Jesus through a lens that obscures the last few days of his life, Brother Robbie, he found approval much more often than he found disapproval. In fact, the Gospels relate several instances to us when Jesus had to hide, had to get away, had to sneak away. Brother, Brother Pete, he even had to distance himself from his disciples from at one time or another due to being thronged, due to the constant pulling, due to the constant burden of, of the needs of people all the time. But in following the example of Jesus Christ, 
There is a strong scriptural foundation for finding approval with God and with man, though it must come in that order. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 1 says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. First thing he says is don't forget the law. Don't forget the law. I got to ask you something. What, what's he referring to when he says don't forget the law? Somebody said something, but you was chicken. <laughs> Y'all think I can't hear when you whisper? I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> my son, forget not my law. It's the word of God. Okay? Don't forget the word. Don't forget the scriptures. You say, what well, now we got we got to pull out what the Bible's saying here. When you're faced with a time when you don't know what to do, or when you're faced with a time that you need some direction, the place you're gonna find direction is in the Word of God. And you can't forget it. Okay? But let thine heart keep my commandments. Now you couple this together, you pull it all together, and there is a, uh, uh, a, a strong emphasis and a, a strong direction that we have got to spend some time in the Word of God. Not just reading it, but meditating on it and thinking on it uh, and getting it hid in our hearts. The Word of God has got to be on the tip of our tongue. It has got to be the compass by which we direct our lives. Uh, the Word of God has got to be the end all to end all. we got to begin our day with being led by the Word of God and we got to go to sleep being led by the Word of God. I cannot stress enough as, as men and women that are alive and breathing that we will not be successful by ignoring the principles that are in the Word of God. Don't forget the law. When's he speaking about? He's speaking about ever. In every situation, don't forget the law. Don't let the Word of God, let, let, you, let it be such a casual relationship that you can forget it at the drop of a hat. And those same commandments must be kept by your heart. Now I want you to notice that. I want you to notice that. He's not saying, I will keep my commandments in my heart. Of your commandments in my heart. What's it say? Your heart will be the keeper. What is the heart? What is it? It's not talking about this organ that thumpity thumpity thumps in the middle of your chest. When the Bible speaks of the heart, it's speaking of the entire mental and moral makeup right. of a person. Right. It is the seat of your emotions. It's the seat of your feelings. It's who you really are. Right. Okay? And your heart, what does it mean by your heart keeping the commandments? Say that, Brother Robbie. The word I've hid in my heart. Somebody else said something. What'd you say, sis? Just to say that the inner, what, what our deepest thoughts, what, what our first reactions are to things, is what we are inside. It is the reason why you keep the commandments of God is because that's what you want to do. Just like somebody saying, I know in my heart. Exactly. You're exactly right, sis. Is, Brother Pete, the reason why it's so easy to do it is because that's what I want to do. Okay. Yes, it does. Yes. The, hearts, the thoughts of your heart are what you express. Okay? The Bible says in Psalms chapter number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful, nor standeth in the way of sinners. But verse number 2 is what I want to point your attention to. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. Now what does that mean? But his delight 
is in the law of the Lord. It's Sister Maria, when we, when we stop viewing the Word of God as restrictive and start viewing it as freeing. His, I enjoy the preacher preach me the word. Open up the word to me. Tell me what I need to do. I want to know more. I'm hungry for the word of God. Amen. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. That's a state of happiness. Okay. Always how, how can I apply the word today? Memorize the word. Study the word. Hide it in your heart. I, had, I did this one time for testimony service. I, I had everybody stand up and say your favorite Bible verse from memory. I don't want to do that this morning because y'all cut into my time. <laughs> but Sister Maria, we've got to get something in the Word that we can hold on to. We've got to find some benchmark scriptures in the Word that we remember how it felt when it was opened up to us. And we can go back there time and time and time again. Remember, Brother Richard, Brother, Brother Billy, I'm going to preach it again real soon. But that, that's where you get a rhema word. It's something that means something to you that it don't mean to nobody else. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Verse 2, Proverbs 3 and 2. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. We're talking about the commandments of God. Well, we've got, think about, think about it just for a minute, how skewed of a perspective we have of the Word of God. There are things in there that we won't even read, that we'll skim over, that we don't want the preacher to preach about. Because it gets, I, I've, I've laughed before, I preach about all kinds of things and people will be amen and hallelujah until I say something they're doing. <laughs> and then you can just see the, hmm. <laughs> boy, he was doing really good until he got to meddling around in my back porch. For length of days and long life. Those almost seem redundant, don't they? It almost seem like it's saying the same thing. Length of days refers to a quality of life. Okay, having a good life, the quality of life. Long life. Long life is a long time biblical way of defining blessings. Now think about this. What's the, what's the most constant thing about death? What, what do we say about death? It's forever. Ain't nobody wants to go there. But everybody's got to. And, and except for a few rare occasions... When something happens, I don't know if the devil gets in people or what. I don't, I don't know. But I'll tell you, like Daddy always told everybody, you find me dead, call the law. Call the police. Okay, I don't care what it looks like, call the police. The truth of the matter is, death is something that is constant, always with us. Always with us. Last night, as we were unloading from the hayride wagons, the police went out Old King's Highway, three of them just moving and grooving. And I, I knew Garrison was going to be going that way. I knew Tripp was out working somewhere. Knew Meredith and Richard. I want to call everybody. Because I don't want to lose nobody that's close to me. Because death is forever. But death is so is unknown. What happens when you die? I don't know. We, you know, Sister Barker didn't see no light in everything. You know, uh, who, who knows what happens? All right? But the, the, the thing about it is we know very little about death. We just know it's coming, Brother Pete. Everybody in here, if the Lord tarries, we're all going to die. Okay? Don't want to. Ain't ready to. Want to keep everybody all the time. You know, but it don't work that way. So when the Bible speaks of long life, it's speaking to the opposite of our greatest fear, of our greatest question, 
of, a, of the greatest unknown that anybody can even talk about is death, right? So when it speaks of having long life, it's, it's basically canceling out your greatest fears and your, your greatest unknowns. And, and the most perplex, per, perplexing thing about life is being canceled out. And you will, the, you know, the Bible in, in more places than one speaks about having a long life and then about quality of life. But then it says, and peace for length of days and long life and peace. What do you think about peace? The Bible says in Psalms 119 and 165, and I didn't put this in our notes, but 119 and 165 of Psalms says, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now listen, let's put, look, go back to 3 and 2 there. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. What are length of days, long life, and peace being added to? Lovers of the law, the meditating of the law, getting the word of God, hid down in your heart, falling in love with the word of God. Okay? These things are being added unto you. It's talking, it's when you talk about adding, it's growth. Okay, you can grow in the Lord through the Word of God. And then all of these things are benefits to it. They add to the love of the law of God. Verse number three, Proverbs three and three. Here we go. The keys to approval. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Right off the bat, let not. What does that speak to? How would you say that in modern day English? Don't. Don't. Let mercy and truth forsake you. What does that speak to? It speaks to a matter, it's, it's a matter of choice. Right? It's something that we have a choice over. Goes to making it a matter of choice. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Now, Brother Rice, mercy and truth are joined together in this scripture and they're joined on purpose. In the way this scripture reads and in the context of this passage, you cannot have one without the other. Now here's why that is. I think this is beautiful. Mercy. Somebody tell me what mercy is. Well, how, how, define it yourself. You've heard of it before. What's mercy? Compassion, Compassion. Forgiveness. forgiveness, love, empathy, undeserved favor. It's the first cousin of grace. Mercy. Well, get this. Mercy without truth has no boundaries within which to operate. Mercy without boundaries, Brother Robbie, turns into enabling. It has no boundaries. So without the boundary of truth, mercy will follow people all the way into hell. Does that make sense? Without truth, mercy is just a continual enabling to slide down the slide of mediocrity. Okay? Truth, on the other hand, without mercy, is harsh and unyielding. And there's no giving to it when the Word of God. Okay? Truth is learned when reading and meditating on the Word of God. Mercy, which is mentioned first, because mercy balances truth out. So truth must always be, must be applied with mercy always accompanying it.
They, they complement each other. Okay, the Bible says they'd be bound around your neck 